This conference will now be recorded. This has been approved. We're going to item number two, which is our IDC volunteer opportunity. We have IEDC on the, on the phone with us, Mr. Todd Lang and Sue Wright from Moss Point, Mississippi, the EDGE director. So I'll turn it over to Todd and Sue at this point. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? We really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, just to start off, virtual world, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect, perfect. Uh, again, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I would. Uh, I just want to spend a few moments to let everyone know about IEDC, the International Economic Development Council, and the work that we're doing, and, and really proud to be able to do be doing on behalf of Vaga Vista. Um, so my name is Todd Lang. I am a uh, economic development associate with International Economic Development Council, IEDC. Um, IEDC is essentially the premier trade organization for the economic development profession. Uh, we have about 4,000 members throughout the globe, uh, and we, we have the job of, of making your jobs easier. You know, when we do our job well, uh, economic development professionals do their job better. Um, we, uh, we're, we're here today uh, because we have a relationship, a, a grant with the Economic Development Administration, uh, particularly the Austin office, uh, which uh, allows us to engage with communities that have been impacted by some sort of disaster uh, and are in, the, in the, the period of economic development resilience and recovery. Uh, so we have a grant to provide services at no cost to communities uh, in areas uh, that have been impacted by disasters, uh, particularly now, specifically now, working in response to Hurricane Harvey. Um, about, uh, maybe about a year ago or so, uh, 10 months or so ago, I was connected uh, through CAPCOG uh, to Eric. Uh, Eric had said that he would be interested in our services uh, and got to meet Eric face to face in, in uh, your community back, I think, in August of last year. Um, essentially, these services that we provide is uh, connecting your community with a pro bono consultant, an expert economic developer uh, who can give advice and consultation on the different types of economic development efforts that you're focused on. Uh, so, Eric and I met, uh, spoke with Josh quite a bit also. Uh, to really understand the, you know, the, the unique aspects about your community, what's going on in the world of economic development, uh, and then matched up uh, one of our consultants who, again, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Sue speak for herself shortly, but it's a consultant that is going to be able to work with you, again, at no cost uh, to provide insight, advice, consultation on the economic development challenges that you're facing. Uh, we were set to have Sue visit your community because generally uh, these uh, these consulting um, situations are done with our with our consultants offering their time and visiting the community for about a week. I think we had uh, plane tickets almost booked for May, uh, and then obviously um, needed to adjust. So uh, we are we're really happy to be getting uh, kicked off on a virtual aspect here and. Um, IEDC is is still uh, not not in a position where we're sending volunteers to communities, but I think that we're pretty close to doing that. Uh, so I know that Sue and Eric and Josh and I will be talking about those possibilities. Uh, but for now, Sue has been kind enough to be able to uh, offer her time and consultation in this kind of virtual status that we're doing here. So I. I hope that's uh, helpful to everyone. It's been a real pleasure working with Eric and Josh and others. They're so committed to the success of your community uh, and glad to be able to, to pass you a real um, dedicated and, and professional economic developer uh, to share what she knows and really to enhance the work that you're doing. So uh, again, thanks for this opportunity and I'll, I'll pass it on to Sue uh, so she can talk about her background uh, and, and early observations about this project. Thank you so much. Hello, I had internet problems. So am I, are you able to hear me now? No, you do? Yes. All right, good. Well, I'm so happy to join you this evening and I'm looking forward to this experience as we journey through learning from each other and I'd love to help you reach your goals. 
Um, I'll just share a little bit of my background. I have a rather diverse economic development background working from small city of Loosedale, Mississippi of around 3,000 people to the city of Gulfport around 70,000 people, Hancock County Port and Harbor Commission where I did international recruiting and economic development uh, there, done workforce development and now I've been with the city of Moss Point for over six years. So I like the municipal setting the best. Um, I just feel like at the city level, your street level, you're with the people. It, it's just genuine economic development. And I like the outcome of just making lives better. And I like the team approach. And that's what excites me about this opportunity is the team you have developed through your economic development committee and the city and working jointly to achieve the goals your community has. Um, so we kind of talked a little bit, Eric and Josh and I, about some of your situation and some of the goals you had ranging from strategic planning to writing a new narrative. And I did uh, hope at some point my mayor, uh, Mario King, gets to join us for a conversation because what we have been with since Mayor King's administration is being change agents and really determining the direction, the vision and focus we have for the city and what it's gonna to take to get there. And sometimes that means a little disruption, almost experiencing like we have with COVID-19. We have life and patterns in place and we're so accustomed to going in the directions we're familiar with. Sometimes we don't see there are new and sometimes even better approaches. So I kind of like that idea of exploring and seeing what you have in mind, what, what you'd like to see what inspired you to go in this direction of reaching out to someone? And where do you want to see us end up? I'd love to get some feedback from you too. Do you have anything, direction? Or let's just have, can we have a dialogue or would you like to ask me some specific questions? Well, thank you, Sue, again, glad you're Mr. Gage, you're smart. Thank you for um, doing this for us. I think, and I want to go ahead and touch back on Todd. The reason that we are involved, we are a member of the IEDC. Lago Vista is a member of IEDC. Um, I've actually sit for all the classes for IEDC, and I can sit for the, the exam, not a good certification, which Sue already has. So, and and Todd. So, I'm I'm looking forward to that uh, one day as well to go ahead and take my certification in that. So, I've already taken all the classes, but. Um, this is a great opportunity. I think it is for 40 hours, if I remember correct, that Sue was able to help us in a, any initiative. We did talk with myself and Josh. We did talk about changing our narrative, some strategic planning. Um, I think Sue has a background into in the downtown rede redevelopment. So I kind of want to touch on that too as well, because mm -hmm. we kind of still struggle with our downtown or where we're going to put the downtown, how it's going to look and those type of things. So the floor is open. Does anyone have any comments that I want to ask Sue any questions? I would love to touch on and learn about strategies to um, attract businesses to our community and strategies that you've put in place in other communities about our size um, that have been impactful. Sure. What, um, if I may ask, do you have a direction of what you're trying to attract from retail, hospitality, want industry, some of all of it? Well, I think some of all of it. I think. You know, one of the, the limiting factors here is our daytime population when it comes to attracting other retailers um, or, you know, restaurants or what have you is, you know, daytime population and attracting, you know, area employers um, so that we could increase that daytime so that we could become more attractive to these other brands that we would like to invite into our community. Um, I think most of these that we are, that I'm experienced with are looking for a bigger base in population and population in a way to overcome that, to show them that, you know, the business owners that are here in our community already, how do we highlight them to say, you know, their, you know, business operations are really actually not as reflective to the population and maybe are better than that. Or they're having higher, um, okay. higher sales or whatever than they expected. And I think due, um, due I to our... Go ahead. I was going to say that I did see 
you had consulted with retail strategies. Um, I found that in recruiting new business, having your data and your facts in place, your inventory, your buildings, available properties, all of that attracts is what, I mean, you've got to have that database and know your community to really reach out effectively. Excuse me. Thank you. I apologize. We've been training on this. <laughs> Excuse me, just a minute. <laughs> you know, I'm the same way when Zeno tells me to get out of his office. So I told him <laughs> what's going on. It, it happens often. I go in just to look at those statues too. And then he tells me I can't be in his office. So then I have to leave and come back. And typically I don't have the video option. So we get it. Yeah. Hey, don't worry about it. That's what happens when we're living the way we are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, how did your experience with retail strategies go? I read the report. I mean, it was quite extensive. Have you actually acted on some of their implement, their suggestions? Suggestions. Yeah, we just received a report. We're coming up on. And our... also say... Go ahead. I'm sorry, Sue. Huh? No, I'm just up... gonna say since they met with you, Eric. Yeah, I was gonna ask. We're coming up on our one-year anniversary with retail strategies. We got a um, detailed report from them. Of course, as you know, we all know COVID-19. The past three months have kind of mm -hmm. uh, been a you know a damper on some of that, but it was a pretty intense report. It kind of gave us some ideas and some things, and some, we still have some of those opportunities. I think they're gonna that they've come to to bear with us as we continue with them. Um, we're looking at them maybe possibly have a three year possible could do with three years with them. This is our anniversary of this year. They actually extended our our um, extended us two months because of COVID-19 so we could contact, do the retail live show, which is in Austin, September mm -hmm. 3rd. So they're going to represent us and be at the retail live show, the first uh, retail show since the COVID-19 will be up in Austin on September 13th. So I think the report was great. We got great feedback. We just need to keep the momentum going, I think. And that, but... Have they mentioned to you that since they did that report that they've added a downtown development specialist with them and they have like a, a i don't know what you're talking about on september 13th but they now have an intense retail development program and i, I it seems excellent and the young woman that they hired um, has had a lot of success and I, I know one of your goals is to actually develop a physical town center but even without that there's a way of building that sense of community and town without it. And I, I just thought maybe a talk with retail strategies about their new downtown specialist might be of interest to at least explore that. Yes, we have. I was on a webinar with her um, that she did a downtown um, webinar with us and we did speak with her um, after the webinar. So we are looking at those things as well. And that's something I could help follow up with. We too have been talking with them about the downtown program. I think I mentioned to Eric that um, we're part of the Mississippi Main Street program. And I know there's a Main Street program in Texas. Um, I have found because that is member-based and community-based, the Main Street program, when getting help from the national level, your state level, being involved with the other Main Street directors and programs, it's about the most effective thing we have in Mississippi. And you know, all of our cities, what are we? Moss Point's 14,000 people and we're the 30th largest city in the state. So that tells you something. Mississippi is made up of small cities and Main Street drives the economic development program for so many of the cities. And again, I'm gonna come back to what a success is and where I see your strength. It's having that broad cross-section of the community 
actively engaged in the economic development process that moves a community forward. And when we talk about recruiting and landing those retail businesses, when you don't have the numbers, it's a real challenge. They're cold-blooded in making their decisions about where they go. And if you don't have the numbers, so often they won't come. So when you have a community who has influence and you know people who could be your, um, invest in the franchises, so to speak, and, and actively work with the change that you're trying to get, you can persuade them often to come to your community even if you're a little short on the numbers. It, it just takes that concerted effort and having your facts, your story together, um, knowing the sales from the other retail businesses in your community to show the market is there. Um, I just really believe Main Street and even this program with retail strategy, since you have a relationship with them and you've already invested so far, maybe carry that out to see where that can lead you. Uh -huh. I, I, this is Dave Williams. Uh, I think Hi, David. one of the problems that I think we have in Lago Vista is we have a town center area where City Hall is located and the police department is located and Veterans Park is located, but it's in the middle of the residential neighborhood. Okay. And a lot of the citizens want that to be the downtown area. But the other issue we have is most of the market and the CVS and uh, the restaurants are up at 1431 and Loman, which in one respect should be the downtown area. So we have two different areas where we have a conflict on what, what what the downtown area should be. Right. I don't know if we have a solution to that, but it's one of our problems. Do you have an urban planner on your staff? Or are you affiliated with any of the urban planning entities? Um, land use, people familiar with that? Yes, we don't have one on staff, but I am familiar with some of them in Austin. We don't have one on staff though. Um, a lot of these things, from my experience, can be driven from that urban planning, your zoning, uh, kind of your comprehensive plan as well, is how you kind of, um, one, drive it to occur a certain way, or you can facilitate the organic growth of your community. We have a neighboring city, um, Gaucher, Mississippi, same thing, a relatively new city formed in about the 80s. Um, they don't have a town center. They're facing that same dilemma. They're wanting to build that cohesion that so many communities, especially Texas communities, have around that square and that defined downtown area, and they don't have it. So they're trying to create that as well, and they're doing it incrementally around their city hall, which just sits out on a highway. There's no, there's no nucleus there, but they are building it. So I'm kind of familiar with that strategy. Um, well, I've looked at you on the internet and looked at some maps. I don't have a visual cue in my mind of the physical comparison between the two locations. Okay. And what's the name of the city that you just mentioned? Gaucher, G-A-U-T-I-E-R. Gotcha. Thank Very you. progressive city. They Mm -hmm. You might look them up on the internet and I can even connect you with some of their, like their mayor and their board, wonderful partners of ours. Great, thanks. And in the Main Street program in my previous um, stuff, my previous before Lago Vista, we did work in Main Street, but we worked with them as a Williamson County entity with more than just one city because of the requir cutting requirements that Texas would Required, and so right. that we need to look at, but it's certain requirements that, that that I don't think we would be able to get one unless we have one full staff here. We won't be able to do that unless we work with other entities because the population of the city is not there for the main street person. 
Yeah, they um, nationwide they do have the requirement to at least have a part-time director. They prefer a full-time. Sometimes you can't get started as we did in Moss Point with a part-time director. We're still doing it part-time. I'm I'm filling that role as a part-time person, full-time economic developer. So there are some ways around it. You can be a city uh, entity and have it fully staffed by the city, or it can be a separate 501c3 nonprofit. But you do need a director, someone to tend to the day-to-day -day activities. Even though you have a board, it still does take that. It might be, should you ever see your way in your own municipal budget, to have that staff person come out of the city for your contribution to the Main Street program is providing that staff support or maybe even office space. That, that's just how we do it. And that keeps, even though our non, our Main Street is a 501c3, they're a separate entity, we work in partnership through our investment through the director and the, the office space. We pay for the dues, we pay for the three mandatory trainings a year. And then the Main Street group does their own fundraising to take on their projects. There's just a host of ways, and I've always found that the main streets are open to making it fit the community they're in. I just think if you reach out to your Texas Main Street program, they would be delighted to add another community. And I don't Can think it has to be expensive beyond. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's all these great technical delays. But you mentioned that you've looked at all of our, our materials and our website and um, virtually taken a tour of Lago Vista. Do you see any things that jumped out at you that we need to improve as far as the, the information that's out there or how accessible it is? I mean, do you have some, some feedback on what you have seen? I was so impressed. Um, no, I think y'all's website is lovely. Everything I've seen from Facebook and other looks in at Lago Vista, I mean, y'all are an amazing community. In fact, I question sometimes why you needed a consultant. You seem so on top of things. Um, the only thing I could say is that the more specific you are in having the data readily available that retailers are looking for specifically, the more they can find on your website that, like your retail strategies report, make that available, but also having a section some way that you could guide developers to quickly get the answers to their questions. They're going to want to know available buildings, the square footage, what's available. They're going to want to know your demographics. Um, and you can do some research in addition to what Retail Strategies gives you to find out what, say, your target group. They gave you a list of who might be good matches. You could even go farther and look up for them what their square footage is they're looking for, the population, um, other retailers that they like to associate with. That information is out there. It takes a lot of digging, but it can be gotten. And then once you know, just like any other sales approach, the more you know of the hot buttons, the needs, the pressure points of who you're trying to recruit and you find those solutions, that's that's where you're gonna get it. Get that conversation going. I think you're gonna find that just straight up entrepreneurship, small business development is gonna land you more than an outright recruiting program. You gotta do the recruiting side by having your facts ready, but um, it was, it's a tough one. I'm, I'm just not going to cloud that. It is tough meeting. And there's no silver bullet that I've found of how to get retailers to come to your community. Same thing on the hotel. I noticed you didn't have your own hotel. I would love to yeah, see you have a hotel. That's it's one of the hard one, of one to approach. Uh, that's one yeah, that we with move. all you have going. Mm -hmm. I say that's one of our real needs that we've been that that we've been uh, sort of focusing on 
uh, since the beginning because we are basically a, a destination. Uh, we're, we're sitting on a peninsula uh, surrounded basically by water, which is, which is beautiful. And we have uh, the famous Texas Hill Country uh, with us. And, you know, we're just a, a beautiful, ideal place. And we, we're even part of a bird sanctuary. I mean, what else could you ask for? Right. But we don't have that hotel. We've got a couple of golf courses that we could uh, actually make a lot of hay on. But if we had tournaments and so on and so forth, there's no place for people to stay. And, and you know, one thing would feed the other. If And I think Dave Williams has usually has the closest answer to whether we're going to have a hotel or not, but uh, I think he's asleep right now. <clears throat> but uh, that's that's a real necessity. How are we doing now, Dave? I might have to cut your arm off if I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing that for a while. I've been hearing that for a while. Yeah, and you know, it's a. It's, Gosh. Gosh, can we give them many updates on hotels or anything? Yeah, you know, Zeno has actually been working directly with our uh, with our uh, hotel developer. Uh, he talked to them yesterday, and they've picked out uh, preferential lots. They're working through Zeno to get uh, financing packages for the construction aspect, uh, but they're working on their plan now. I hope that means that they're going to successfully come sooner rather than later but it's it's all a matter of COVID-19 as, as Sue and Eric both talked about slowed down development processes for everyone now the challenge is how does it ramp back up how effective are we and able to in our efforts to uh, put partners together to make it happen so uh, let's just say it all rests on Eric Zeno's shoulders so hope he's doing some push-ups you know, I've lived in several little towns, little towns about the same size as Long Vista. And the mainstream, main street thing has been interesting because it does, is not necessarily where you expect it would be. David, when you were talking about it, should it be by City Hall or out on the highway? And I think for Lago Vista, it should be by City Hall. Sunday, we went for the first time to the, to the, uh, farmer's market on Sunday, and I was really surprised at how many people there were there and what a nice time they were having. And with the picnic pit tables, now people are feel comfortably outdoors and there are people with their masks on, but the music was great and people were visiting and I thought, okay, this is what a small town should be like. There should be a place where on weekends you can gather or on Wednesday, you know, Wednesday nights or whatever, often they're special. I think the, the Main Street people in the last little town where I lived was really helpful is in getting Main Street. And Main Street was off the, was not on the corner. There are two major highways went through there. That was not where Main Street was. It was four blocks down the street where the old city started. So I think there's a lot of hope if we, if we use our imagination. I agree. So Sue, I want to ask you too. With, say uh, your... I mean, I, mm -hmm. I believe that around City Hall, that should be the same people gather and have functions and. Go ahead, Eric. Sue, I want to ask you. I know we, ahead, all, we all read, we all know that the COVID nineteen this past few months. Did you have any challenges in um, your city with the COVID-19 and the challenges that you, you experienced and how did y'all overcome that? Or are you still overcoming that at this point in time? And also we talked about, me, you and Josh talked about, you know, kind of our narrative of changing our narrative and everybody being on one side, on the same page. And that kind of predates me here because before I got here, we had some with for growth, some was not for growth. So, you know, changing that narrative, everybody being on the same page. Could you speak to that, please? Well, let me tell you about COVID. Um, the city of Moss Point was one of the highest per capita affected cities in the state of Mississippi for COVID impact. We are 72% African American community, and we just fit the profile across the board 
of experiencing COVID's impact to our community. And it's been rather devastating. Um, we'll bring back almost everything centers around leadership. If there's one thing in lead your goal for, it, it really comes down to leadership. And I will say our mayor and board led the city through this crisis. We, um, we virtually just shut the city down. We're feeling the effects negatively on our revenue, but in the long time, and we're looking forward, lives have been saved, even though we had one of the highest cases of death and cases of COVID in the state. We know lives have been saved and we know our economy has been saved in the long term. So going forward, we are, we're just taking kind of the approach I told you, our, our mayor's administration has been focused on rejuvenation. That's kind of been our theme. And we're coming out looking at this disruption to our economy and how can we capitalize on this new learning, what we've learned through it, can we explore new learning opportunities and just take our city to another level? We don't have retail in our city. I, I work in Moss Point, but I live in a community 40 miles north, Loosedale, Mississippi, about 3,000 population. We have more retail in Loosedale than the city of Moss Point has. When I was the economic developer here in Loosedale, we didn't have any retail when I started almost 20 years ago but we, weren't, we couldn't become a Main Street community. We, didn't, we couldn't get that, but we just started our, our own Main Street program. We weren't in the state, but we followed their guidelines and we took it step by step. We started with, and again, I'll go back to leadership. We had a dynamic mayor at that time. We just worked with the retail, the uh, real estate community, all the salesmen in the city. We just pulled all the stops out on everybody who knew how to sell and everybody just worked together and business by business, downtown became. Loosedale, as an example, is a city on two highways. Old downtown is way away from all of that. It's kind of like just an old town off by itself. But surely one by one, it came. Now, I left 10 years ago to go to other communities, but um, now downtown is fully occupied on Main Street in Loosedale. And what's happened is it's been entrepreneurship, small businesses, and in the last two years, I'll give credit to the younger generation. I'm, I'm not talking about millennials. I'm talking about 40-year-olds. It just seems like that the younger business community is just taken an interest and business after business has just come in and built. And I'm telling you, Loosedale's 3,000 people and they have much more than Moss Point has. So our strategy in Moss Point is trying to build that same thing, a vision that the community can buy into and believe in and know that if we work hard, the incremental growth is going to get us somewhere. And we know there's, we've tried, there's no silver bullet. Um, but we just believe that we can take it step by step and reach our goal. So we're blessed with 10 hotels at one intersection in Moss Point. Our economy is driven by the Interstate 10 and the intersection of Highway 63. Some 48,000 cars a day go by us on their way to work at the shipyard, which is the largest employer in the state of Mississippi, and Chevron, the largest oil refinery in the world for, for Chevron. So we have a lot of workers coming through our city. We have, let me think, about 16,000 cars a day flying down our main street, but they're not stopping and they're not shopping with us. So we're trying to look at how can we modify traffic? How can we make entry and exit and parking? How can we improve walkability? What are those structural things that we can do to help facilitate people to stop and spend their money with us? We're on a downtown river. 
we have two rivers downtown. We're virtually surrounded on three sides by water. We have the Audubon Nature Center in Moss Point, one of just 43 in the country. But we don't have places for those 10,000 visitors a year to eat at in downtown Moss Point. So I feel your pain on trying to recruit when we, we get them up on the interstate, but getting them in our downtown, which is picturesque, one of the prettiest downtowns anywhere. I'll even say we could compete with Lago Vista and beauty. Um, but getting the businesses to choose to invest in our downtown has been a challenge. So um, we've reached out all the same ways you have, and our focus is on what we're calling Innovation Village. We're cre trying to create that entrepreneurial spirit and attract younger people to invest in new business ideas, things that can um, not necessarily be the traditional retail footprint. So we're, we're exploring mm -hmm. into new territory also. One of the other issues that we have is we have a lake, but we have no, from a city standpoint, we have no access to the lake, okay? It's all controlled by the POA, so it's not controlled by the city in any way. So there's no way for okay. us to let people from the outside come in and get to the lake. I understand that one. In George County, where the city of Loosedale is, some of the best hunting and fishing grounds ever, but we face that same challenge. It's all in public property. The state owns it, that the Nature Conservancy owns it. So how, when you've got all this prime hunting and fishing area, how to get the people access to it? We're still struggling with that because we just have um, hunting clubs. So they're all privately driven. So we have that magnificent resource of the Pascagoula River in George County, runs down to the coast, and all that wonderful hunting land that could be a tourist mecca. But the private home owners of the property don't see that greater good of the whole community. Now, that's a tough one. I hadn't solved that myself. But I mean, possibly some memorandums with the property, I guess the POA means Property Owners Association, um, working with those private entities of how you can mutually benefit. I mean, that's some things we could explore. Sue, can you spell the name of the town that you are from? Loosedale, L-U-C-E-D-A-L-E. -E. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm looking at another. The map. With, <laughs> okay, superior leadership. I, I'll just tell you, um, mayor and board for several administrations now who have been consistent in just working every day to just make the town better and. I'm also a member of a group called the Gulf Coast Business Council. You can look them up too. The Gulf Coast Business Council is made, is a policy entity made up of um, private sector business leaders across the whole Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, and in that, I was part of a leadership class that focused on community development compared to economic development. And um, I guess over the three years I've been affiliated with the program, it's, it, and as an economic developer, I say it still boils down to creating a community, an environment that people are attracted to. So when you grow your community by its aesthetic value, its spirit, its welcoming, the amenities that you have, that it's a place people are attracted to then you're, populate, you're getting population. I mean, y'all are growing fast. So what, what would make people want to invest their money in a business, either the people that are there or attracting new people in? Um, but just as a city, 
I mean, looking at your parks, the recreation program, all of those things that attract people and make them feel at home, have that sense of community, your events, your festivals, those gathering places you mentioned, Robin, all of those things build community and make people feel like they belong. And when people feel that, then things just naturally grow out of it. And I know it's not a quick answer, but at the heart of the matter, the heart of your city, it really is all of those relationships and making people feel at home and, and invested in your future. Could you speak on the narrative for a second, Sue? Changing the narrative. Changing the narrative? Hmm. Well, I, your narrative doesn't necessarily need to be changed from what I said, but maybe coming up and articulating your vision, the direction you want to go, who is it that you want to be? You're, you're still a new city. So what what is the vision? Have you had community visioning sessions? Um, have you done an asset assessment? Have you done a needs assessment? Have you had that community input to say, well, let's focus on our tourism opportunity. And if we're drawing more tourists because of our amenities and we can demonstrate those visitor experiences, then the hotel and the restaurants are going to want to be there to serve that need. Tourism when you look at the economic impact of tourism, especially from the nature-based tourists and bird walkers, then that absolutely is the driver. Um, they spend more money than anyone. So I just think that's the opportunity. Your tourism, your downtown development seem like natural. I think in Mississippi, we've proven that for every dollar invested in tourism, we get $25 back, might be up to 47, I really don't, can't remember. It's almost like a no brainer. The more you invest, the more return you get in tourism. And you certainly have the amenities. And I was looking at the country promotions, and it just seems tying your coattail to theirs, getting your marketing materials in the same channels they're doing, even the printed brochure, where they're distributing theirs and they see they're going to those areas because those areas have more money invested in their tourism recruitment plan. If you're tied to them, then you're going to get more exposure to the people who could then come to see you. We try to do that with the casinos here on the coast. We don't have the money to invest, but we try to get our information out to the casinos where they're distributing, and so their visitors might make a day trip over to see us. Um, so I mean, and see, we just call this kind of whole idea. I would call this whole idea. Um, sorry, <laughs> I would call everything that you're talking about is something that they say that they call place marketing. So marketing what our yes. place is, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and that has many different components, Absolutely. like you say, one of the components is travel tourism, and then there are other different identity things that we could think about, I guess. I think absolutely the tourism is a great avenue and it's going to, that helps you get documented numbers that your audience, then you put on your festivals and events. The tourists that are coming maybe for other things will attend those. I mean, that's what started Chambers of Commerce even years ago. I mean, Chambers dreamed up tourism as a way to get people to come into their town, see their town, experience it, and want to come back, want to live there. So they all work hand in hand. But when you don't have the numbers to get out there and say, we've got this, this, and this, that this particular chain wants and it's their proven model we've got to take a different approach and when you it's all numbers driven show them numbers one way or another but it just seems like tourism you've got so much to offer and that feeds into downtown development 
which then feeds into retail development citywide. And Erica, I'm so pleased you've got a hotel developer on the hook, wonderful. But there are two hotel associations that you might look at. Um, the Asian American, you, you're familiar with those? Um, the, those hotel associations are trying to help, especially the ones that work with the minorities, to help get them a leadership, a management role. And um, that's just another avenue of hotel recruiting. And they even work on those marketing market studies, which again, hotels drive on numbers. If the numbers aren't there, they're not coming. It's their money they're investing and it's just same as you. Sometimes you'll take a risk when your heart is there, but otherwise, no, you're going to protect your, your investment. Do you, have a, do you have a net because that hook that I have them on, they don't seem to want to bite all around that hook. Can I just go ahead and use that net and you know pull them on in and you okay. loan me that net from? <laughs> uh, Eric, we do have the bird he, she's right about the bird watchers that come to Balcones. Unfortunately, they're being served by a neighboring city called Marble Falls that does have a lot of tourism. Uh, they stay there. And unfortunately for what this 22,000 acre uh, wildlife refuge, their address is Marble Falls, even though they're 22 miles closer to Lago Vista. So that's one obstacle that we can't change, but they do have tourists, lots of them. And I believe the number from the, um, the head of that uh, wildlife refuge is 98,000 a year. We also have a park that newly opened, but then it closed for COVID, but we have a beautiful uh, Travis County Park that people can get to the lake and um, does have boat ramps, camping and hiking. So that's our another big asset, um, but people are coming from Texas, going to the lake and then going back home. And if people do stay, then they, those people stay in Cedar Park. So we're kind of between two cities that have all that, but we want them to choose to stay here yes. and get this hotel to stay here. You know, we're hoping to have some wedding business. There's lots of tourism with the wedding business. We had it for a while and we're hoping it'll come back after COVID. So we do have people. And then we're, our next thing that we are developing is the uh, sports complex because we want to get um, tournaments so that Plus, loads of people will come, see the tournaments, eat at our one and only fast food place, Sonic, and then other ones would want to join us. So it currently looks like these people are served, and but they have to drive to get there. We want the focus to be on Lago Vista. And Sue and Todd, in case Absolutely. you know this, Elaine, Elaine is our chamber president, in case you didn't know who was speaking. So Elaine is the chamber president, so y'all know who that was to speak for. Are you on mute? Hey, Lane. I apologize again. I was a chamber director for eight years, so I, I have a soft spot for chambers. And in Moss Point, we really have a strong relationship with our chamber of commerce. We actually have a countywide chamber, and it's served by, we have four municipalities in our county, and they have what's called area councils that represent each city. So we do feel like we have our own Moss Point Chamber, while our businesses take advantage and have the benefit of the larger membership. We also um, kind of rely on the Chamber to do our small business training. They do the workshops, the educational component, teach the entrepreneurship programs. And our partnership, again, as a city, is we pay dues. We're a member. We are actively engaged with people from the city staff who join different committees, and we try to support the chamber in that way. Um, I don't know how y'all work there, but um, well, anyway, we, the chamber can certainly be a strong. Um, of course, until COVID, we did a lot of networking. We combined three cities, one called Jonestown Point Venture with Lago Vista is by far the largest, but that gets us a bigger area too. Um, there's small businesses there. We have 250 members, but some of them are in Austin and they want to appeal to our people. We do have um, mm -hmm. some homes here that are only weekend homes or family lake house homes. 
Um, so what Julie brought up with our daytime population, people live here and then go to Austin to work. Everything's turned upside down that they're working from home. Even the numbers I have seem to be obsolete. We kind of need to see what new trends are going to come out of the COVID and of course, how long it lasts. Well, one thing, chambers are membership driven, and that's a distinction we've made with the city. We're trying to encourage more businesses to join the chamber. Um, $350 a year may not, I don't know what your dues are. Our dues are low. Um, yeah. Our dues are low. Uh, we have the majority of the businesses. Um, there's some bars we don't have, but you know, we try to provide services for them, but mostly networking. We have a lot of real estate agents because we have a lot of homes for sale. Yes, a lot of salespeople who need the networking connections. Right, right. right. But it's a niche in the city, the way we try to work here, the Chamber's one of our partners, one of many, and there's a, a relationship value there just as there will be if they start a Main Street program, which has a different focus than the Chamber. Um, and then there's other partners. I'll tell you something, we just started um, getting going maybe two months now, a private group got together, they call it the Moss Point Community Development Fund. And this is just a small group of um, residents that pitched in $100 each, that's all. I mean, there's no deep pockets here. But one of the ways they're working with the city is we've um, developed a resolution and a memorandum of understanding that they are working proactively to identify properties that could be developed, that strategic ways that we can build on the city asset. And um, that's proving to be beneficial. They're helping us negotiate with some property owners who have an industrial site right as you come off the bridge into beautiful downtown Moss Point on the river, and we've got these industrial uses. So they're gonna start working on trying to private to private negotiations and talks. How could they help facilitate that? We, um, they've identified some properties that could be combined in a watershed. So we're making a grant application to our state. Um, it's not something that you have where you are, but it's tidally affected properties that revenue comes in from oil leases, and we apply back for grants for that. But I'm sharing with you the power of teams and teams of teams who are all going in the same direction to reach the same goals that I believe the leadership identified through Mr. Ray and your mayor, your board, um, all of you together kind of harnessing that power of here's where we want to go. Here's how we can get there. And people, just like this community development fund, they're not the answer to everything, but my gosh, already in two months, they've identified some valuable resources and influence that group has. They're not functioning any other way but to go identify properties that they could bring to our attention that we could apply for grants to acquire or they're going to buy them so for example let's say we've got a nice neighborhood but yet there's this one troubling property their intention is to buy that property and fix it up and sell it so that they lift the entire neighborhood so um we're just early stages but there's a group in mobile alabama called Porchlight, who does a similar thing. And I, I don't know that your community has areas that need fixing up, but like Mobile, Alabama, one of the most beautiful cities in Alabama, historic downtown, but they have properties, commercial and residential, that are falling on disrepair. And this group put together engineers, architects, just interested people, and they're buying select properties and fixing them up to keep the neighborhoods lifted. And it's just a wonderful, again, community spirit. And it maybe you draw a parallel. What is a need? What do you see as some of the obstacles you have in your community? And is there a group in a way that could approach that and they solve it? 
And that's where I see Eric's role is. He's the driver of all of this, but he's got to have some help. I can tell you, one man can't do all there is to do. If he's chasing a hotel, I'm telling you that just the details of that one project alone can take up his time. So where does he get the time to do the high level thinking and the training? He's been through IEDC. He knows the knowledge, but him getting the time to do it. That again is where y'all can come in and help him with that support, administrative support, research support, help him get an assistant. If you don't have one, Eric, I'm just saying from experiences, department of one, I know the challenges of being a department of one. It's hard, um, but he, but following Eric's lead on the direction and him helping coordinate all of these different arms, each one of you, as I look at where you work, I know you have assets and ideas that can be capitalized on through your committee and maybe other ways. I didn't share with you also why our new, new partner really is the churches. Um, we've just united all of the churches. COVID help. We had already started it. That may not be a big thing in your area, but in Mississippi, oh, yeah. churches are our social leadership core. Yes. So through COVID, we really started pulling the pastors together as a communication tool and trying to push information out through the churches. And it has evolved since then to people being so interested. We do a weekly call with the pastors. So we have about 14 or 15 that it changes, but are on the call every week. And we just talk about community issues and then they network through their church. Um, speaking of COVID and this new pastoral relationship, we are looking at establishing, and this was Mayor King's idea of what's called a congregational health network. And we're just trying to help the health needs of our community and the churches helping be navigators to health care services. And we're trying to raise the money now to um, pay for an executive director who would just coordinate through all of the churches the health care needs of the, the parishioners and how to follow up on their health needs and working in partnership with the hospitals and the health care providers. So again, just kind of an inspiration that grew out of a pretty dire need we had when COVID was at its peak here. But just thinking of long term, how much that does on building community where we are better connected and we're stronger as a result of all of us working together. We do have a ministerial alliance. We have um, 11 churches mm -hmm. that are chamber members. We have a thing called the President's Club where the presidents of all the civic groups, we have a lot of arts groups and keep log of Vista beautiful, a lot of other things. So we meet quarterly with them. I'm also on a trail committee because we want to do ecotourism. So we want to build these trails so that people will hopefully right. stay in this hotel, but at least come visit, walk on the trails and maybe spend some money at the gas station or at the um, fast food place. So we have a lot of things working and, and Eric is new. We're glad to have him department of one because we used to have zero people and he is a big improvement with the focus and um, and we believe if we got one hotel others would could follow so um give eric credit i didn't believe you need that one eric i wish you the best with that hotel you truly do need it because it can be again a focus that other things can revolve around do y'all have hotel taxes? I mean, are you able to get a occupancy tax in your community? Yes, because we have a lot of rentals. We have condo rentals and um, that's where Josh is controlling the hotel occupancy tax. And part of that money supports the chamber. Okay. And, that's, and that's how we keep our chamber membership rates lower than our neighboring cities. But what we don't have is the sales tax. Aren't you we don't get the EDC right. sales tax because we support a bus service. Yes. Also useful. I'm sure they told you about that. Okay. 
Well, in Mississippi and in Moss Point particularly, our hotel tax comes 100% to the city. We get 3% of our hotel revenue to fund our economic development program. So we're kind of like that other sales tax generation that Texas cities are so famous for. Some cities get a lot of money from that sales tax. Yeah. With that, uh, any more questions for Sue? If not, I know we're going to we'll move on. We definitely appreciate Sue and Todd being on this call. Um, Elaine, you got another question for? I, I just wanted, uh, Don didn't speak about his 5G thing to bring people to live here. I didn't know if he needed an opportunity for that. I, I think, I, I don't know if you all got a chance to take a look at it, but I sent a thread around to everybody that shows what people are, are publishing on the uh, what is it next door or or one of the other services like that and that's a constant uh comment situation going around all of our all of our uh, all of our town and what the deal is is that we are an ideal place to live but the business to be done is in austin and northwest austin and so on and so forth Apple's coming in with a huge new campus. What we want to be able to do is to provide the electronic infrastructure here so that we can have all of those, you know, all of the techies and so on and so forth, bring their families out here to live in a wonderful place and be able to virtually work, you know, from their own offices or whatever in their homes and uh, and connect with, with downtown and with the Apple campus and, so on and so forth and that's been a priority of ours and uh, uh, Eric and Josh have uh, worked quite well with one of the providers of high-speed internet out here which is Spectrum uh, but we also sort of have in our mind's eye out there the possibility of getting into the 5G business but we just there's that's another situation where we just don't have the population uh, to cause the investment in the infrastructure but it's very important to us to to be to offer the best that we can offer and be a viable alternative so we can bring those those higher earning families into logo vista and provide them with the uh, with the amenities and everything like that uh, because once they're here that will bring in the other businesses mm -hmm. it's just a natural deal Excellent. so we've been We've been working on that, and I think it's it's going. Uh, uh, Spectrum has been cooperating very well, and I think they're getting better and better on their rollout. Do you know, Eric? You're muted. You would have if I unmute myself. Yes, I think Josh and the mayor had a conversation with them a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're still rolling, but of course. Um, still working but it's just you no know, slow process but it's still um, coming to life on but we're, we're very aware of, of that that need and how we can we can provide the you know the the ideal place for for those families to to live but we've got to be able to compete in the electronic infrastructure so that you know it's not a downside living out here Well, Don, I, Don, I think you've got something to run with, and I'll even ask Todd. Seems like I've seen some IEDC publications in this area. In Mississippi, we just passed some legislation giving the um, electric cooperatives the go-ahead to provide broadband to, to smaller communities who don't have the um, capacity. So there may be some state legislation or some opportunities there because you're spot on. If you get the people to live there, especially the high income generators, that's just going to drive everything else you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Bob, do you have any input in this area? I'm just, I mean, just briefly, I mean, we could certainly connect to you. Um, you know, Sue's going to do a great job and she's has frankly done already uh, on providing a lot of insight, but we could certainly look into other communities that have focused on that 
um, and uh, and glad to do that. But but also just just a general comment on this. You know, um, IEDC has had many webinars over the past few months and many different articles about you know the future of economic development, the future of places. I think it's, you know, it's almost foolish for anyone to admit that they really know what's going to happen long term with the result of, of this pandemic. Uh, but people are starting to, to read the tea leaves a little bit. And, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the attraction of, of business is not going to go away. Um, but for all communities, the attraction of people is going to be a higher priority. Uh, and it really puts communities like Lago Vista in a good spot. Uh, because of the assets that that you have for kind of quality of life sort of things and, and uh, access, you know access to a to a city but not necessarily needing to go there so um, so yeah the, the fact that you're thinking through these things and and possibly able to capitalize that is is great um, and as sue said the opportunity to to you know if needed to connect you with communities that that uh, that have maybe looking at this a little bit earlier than you have to learn from them, uh, that is something that we can do as well. well there are some cities uh, near, some smaller cities nearby that, that have gotten into the, uh, into the business of, of bro expanding broadband via uh, the electrical system and everything like that. I'm not sure how much good that would do us uh, since we, you know, we already have the agreements with Spectrum and AT&T and so on and so forth, uh, but it's worth looking at. You know, anything, any anything that will help will help. Well, and Spectrum could even help you market entity for their internet services. Um, it's going to be mutually beneficial for them. So, mm -hmm. I mean, why not just reach out? See what you can do, start marketing what you have because COVID's turned the world up. You know, our city fired a remote um, assistant to the mayor because our board at the time, almost two years ago, did not believe you could do your job if you weren't in the office. Mm. And now they're showing, being shown that the mayor was right. You can work remotely and be effective, but all of this takes mindset changing and something like COVID to make an impression on people, but the workplace is going to change. I don't, I don't believe that offices are totally going away, but my goodness, even myself, the opportunity to have more time with my family, not have that hour drive every morning and afternoon, it's, it's made um, place important. And when you can work and maybe go out to the lake and have your laptop and work, be able to drive into Austin, um, I just think you're on a path and then everything you've got to offer. It's just a package that you might even look at. How do we tell our story, not only on your website, Facebook, but I mean, what are some of those things I'm trying to think to that travelers use and pops up on their phone and all that? looking at the various technology so that when tourists are in the area, Lago Vista pops up. And even working with some of your destinations, you mentioned weddings. Oh my goodness, that's that's a big deal of getting families and people to come in. So if you've got some wedding venues, that's just another way to, to market your community. Mm -hmm. so every avenue you have to get groups to come into town. Some of them, one of them is going to have some money and say, I need to put in a restaurant or I need to put in this. Well, I'll tell you, there's a city in Texas. I can't think of their name. They're near Glen Rose. They have the big. Yeah, Glen thing. Rose. There. Oh. I'm sorry. Glenwood. Yes. We go to family reunions there. My goodness. When we first started out, there was nothing there. But I recall being told the story of a resident who lived in New York. She had some theater. She wasn't a big star, but she had. A theater presence. She came home, started a little small theater group. Her friends from New York came in and slowly but surely somebody put in a dress shop, somebody put in a coffee shop. And now with other things that have happened, the whole city has grown. It's just an example of what place making and building that area that you want to, I mean, you guys please yourself and the residents who live there. 
what do y'all want? And then what are those common things that other people are gonna want that will choose your town to live and invest in? Okay. Well, thank you, Sue and, and Todd. I, I will ask them, uh, thank you all for both um, joining us today. What is would be our next step? So I, I kind of like the idea of if it comes to that point of Sue coming to town, I know we might have to do it virtually, but I don't mind waiting to see how to do, but I wouldn't mind seeing Sue in the office and kind of meeting us all and talking if that still is in the, in the in play, we can still do that. But I don't, I'll let you go ahead and speak to what's the next steps on that from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, logical next steps, you know, for, you know, Eric and perhaps Josh uh, and, and Sue and I to get together on a call and, um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what we visited on today and, and, uh, and what, and what makes sense for, for going forward. You know, like I said, I, you know, IEDC is, is still not, um, you know, has not, has not allowed volunteers to travel for our assignments yet. I think we're fairly close though. We, we've got some policies in place uh, that are necessary um, and just need to obey, uh, you know, obviously the, the local guidance, local guidance from both where the volunteer is coming from and, and who the host is, but we can certainly discuss that uh, pending Sue's, you know, schedule of course. Uh, but yeah, glad to talk, you know, anytime over the next you know, few days or early next week on, on that, Eric and Josh, and, and sort out our next steps for this. And, uh, and that will decide whether, you know, whether we kind of move along with a, a, uh, a, a true visit or if we kind of dig in and strategize how to be most effective virtually. Well, we've I'm up for some virtual follow-up talking about some specific things we've touched on today and maybe some recommendations based on what we've talked about today. But if y'all don't know, I am a Texas girl. I was born in Dallas. My mother still lives in the Tyler area. So I go home often. I would love to come visit you. So um, I hope that is on the horizon soon. Well, you better get back to Texas as fast as you can, Sue. I mean, <laughs> but- uh, I know. But my neighbor is trying to get out of the Dallas area. So I'm going to have a long-term Texas connection. We will follow up with you, Todd and Sue. Um, Josh had to, unfortunately, okay. Josh is off the call right now. He had to leave the meeting at another uh, meeting. So Josh is off the, off the call now, but we will follow up and we'll leave it, even if we can't travel then. But even in, in coming up in July, we might even get you to Sue, not on necessarily Todd, if you want to jump, might just get you to jump back on with us um, at our next meeting in July if we can't do some kind of some follow-up on that. No, I agree with that. Let's keep the momentum going. And I'd like to be more intentional and specific. This was a learning for all of us, this call. But I think we covered some areas that can be more specific and start guiding that direction forward. Well, again, yeah, thank you both. Thank I know you for the meeting. At this time, we appreciate y'all joining us. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed meeting all of you. Bye. Bye bye. All right. So, is Julie still on? Absolutely. All right, Miss Julie. Post this it on conference the will now be recorded. Post it on the website in about a week. Oh. Saturday, the Friday before that meeting. So, as you always post it. Got it. Okay. Um, I apologize. I didn't, I'm not aware of that. Um, is there something else on the agenda after that? After Sue? Do we just have my economic development director's follow up? Um, I don't have anything else. I see Josh is back. So is everybody okay, Josh? I know you. Josh is back. He had a. You probably can't hear me. I think Josh is there, but he. I see his face, but he might. But no, I don't have anything else. Um, again, we're scheduled for another meeting in July. We, are, me and Josh, will follow up with IEDC and Sue. Um, any feedback from this meeting? I think um, Gage, of course, was taking no uh, minutes, and so any feedback y'all want to give to relay relate to once we do a follow up with those and kind of kind of get you know Sue and Eric that would best suit us would be definitely um, appreciated. I think it'd be a great help for us, but. Other than that, I don't have anything else unless someone else has something else at this time. 
I have a question that would, I tried to get to it and I don't think she understood what I was trying to say. So, you know, she, she said to keep our details out there and our demographics out there. And so they are out there and they're just not strong enough that pull in the retailers that we're wanting to right now. And so I was wondering if there's tactics that they have used to, 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 in that same instance, when, you know, retailers are looking for more than what we have to fill that gap to say, you know, the opportunity here is greater than you think. So let's use Dairy Queen as an example, just because you guys know I know it inside and out. When I told Dairy, so the developer there um, at Lowe's has tried to work with me to find a franchisee to come out here for a long time. And, um, you know, we look at the demographics and it's just not, it's not compelling. Yet now my daughter works at Sonic and I know that they do $1.6 million in sales annually, right? How do we get that information into our collateral? And can we, is that, is that ethical? You know, cause ultimately any other business QSR business that gets to come out here, it is going to impact our current businesses. So what is, what, where are some tactics that we can meet in the middle that we can showcase that our businesses out here perform at a better, rate than our demographics show right how so she didn't really understand i don't know if she understood my question or what have you so that's that's something i would love for them to really give us some guidance on okay and we do have um what i would do is i ask each of you to um i'll probably wait for about a week before i follow up with them if any any suggestion question you would like for todd and sue shoot those to me cc merited on it as well uh Meredith's great help she's so great with the <laughs> the uh, putting things together for me and everything. So we appreciate Meredith all the time. So could you send me those and I would make sure that's covered. But we do have a, our attorney on, you know, on staff now. So I would ask, so ethically, can we release those numbers? I think we could because it's a public record at that point in time. Can look, I don't know if the city's, so I, I need to ask that question before I answer that any part of it as far as the, the ethical part of that. And okay. I ask our city attorney on it. Awesome. Well, then I think we are wrapped up and can adjourn. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. We will adjourn at 524. It was nice to see y'all. Same you. there. Thank you. So long, everyone.